Hello, and welcome to None of the Above. My name is Steve Nemirovsky, and I'm your host. On None of the Above, we talk about why the political system is dysfunctional and polarized. But what's more important is in every show, we try and offer solutions, uh, you know, how to, how to break down the cycle of dysfunction, how to pare back some of the extremes of the polarization. You're never going to eliminate polarization in politics. Let's face it, that's why we have politics. But you can get to the middle, and you can solve problems, and our system doesn't do that very well right now. A few years ago, we had a sequence where we talked about civility in politics. And unfortunately, I decided we needed to repeat that sequence because, let's face it, uh, we, we have no civility in politics right now. It's just getting worse and worse every day. And I, so, again, I thought we needed to repeat this. And we're going to visit with an old friend, Ted Celeste, who's with the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona, where he heads up uh, an effort called Next Generation, where they try and work with state legislators and others to try and you know, how to figure out how to reinstitute civility into the democratic process. So I thought we'd go back and visit with Ted, among other things. The, the paradigm has shifted so much since we last talked to him, it's almost frightening. Uh, the tone, the, the use of the language, uh, the, the level of intolerance for free speech. I mean, let's face it, our democracy was built on the, the premise of free speech, but now all we do is have people go around and try and prevent free speech. Uh, and it's not just preventing free speech, but the violence and hostilities seem as though they're growing every day. Uh, our interview with Ted was actually going to take place last June, and for a variety of reasons it got postponed, but it was going to be taking place right around when Congressman um, Scalise got shot, and I thought, well, we missed that opportunity because we would have had a hot topic. Well, lo and behold, now we're a few months later, and we have Charlottesville, we have some of the recent developments in Berkeley. It seems as though any time I would want to interview Ted Celeste, uh, there's a, a violent activity in our political discourse. And it's, it, it just seems like we're going downhill fast. So we're going to try and have a few shows and bring back this conversation on civility. And again, we always want solutions. I think you're going to find that uh, Ted is a guy that's going to bring some solutions to the table. So Ted, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Steve. It's good to be back with you. So you must be working like 100 hours a week now instead of only 80 trying to figure out how to fix things. Well, I tell you what, it, uh, our activity level has, has certainly increased and the interest level in what we're trying to do has uh, increased greatly. You know, I was preparing for the interview and, and unfortunately on your website you have a whole section devoted to something called revived civility. Uh, and if you're reviving civility, you've, you're essentially saying civility is dead, right? That You're making a statement right up front with the title. And I thought, right. I'd, I thought I'd just read uh, for my viewers what, what you define as the problem there. It says, incivility in America has reached epidemic proportions. I agree with that. Everyday rudeness, disrespect, and hostility, again, very strong word, sideline collaboration and compromise. Sound bites replace sound journalism. Extremes on both ends of the political spectrum stymie productive dialogue. The public, initially worn and weary, is increasingly enraged about how the lack of civility has left government helpless in the face of our nation's most pressing problems. And then it goes on to talk a little bit about how last year's campaign for president really impacted this as well. What, what are you seeing in your end? What's, what's been changing over the last couple of years? Because five years ago, you thought there was a need for this, and now there's an exponential need for this. Where, where have we gone wrong in the last five years? Well, I think one of the things that happened is, is last year's presidential campaign raised the level of, uh, of the um, discussion to beyond civil discourse into a, a plane that we hadn't seen for a long time. And what it did as a result of both that, that uh, um, combination of the, the uh, carrying on between the two candidates and the election itself is that you, you've changed a dynamic that where it used to be that individuals were, would, would be hostile towards a candidate or towards an elected official. But right now what's happened is they've carried that hostility out to supporters of the candidate that they, they didn't support. And, and it's now created massive problems for families, for churches, uh, for friend, friendships, where this hatred has gotten to a point, and, and vile feelings has gotten to a point where folks cannot have a real conversation with people who used to be friends or family. So you're, you, you, you're doing great work there at the Institute. 
where do you even start to take this on? How do you even define a course of action? Well, part of it is uh, we've we've um, we've identified one of the obvious big pieces of this is that we're living in silos and we don't really um, engage in conversation with someone that we don't agree with, and so we encourage people to to do just that to have what we call an unlikely friendship. We show this wonderful video. It's a four minute video. Uh, anybody that would be interested in looking at that video can. Uh, just Google Donna and Bob. It's on YouTube, and it's about the uh, head of the LGBT community in Iowa and the head of the uh, Family Christian Council in Iowa. The two of them agree to sit down, have a discussion, realize that they're not going to change each other's minds about how they feel about the issues, but perhaps they could get to know each other a little better and stop demonizing each other. And the two principal points of that whole uh, having that kind of discussion are well, the point that Donna makes is if you uh, have the courage to let people know who you really are, good things happen. And what Bob's response is also that once they, once they had this discussion, he understood Donna much better. And when he prepares his press releases or literature, um, he thinks before he does it, what would Donna think about this? And it, so that kind of discussion we're, we're encouraging take place in families, uh, in, in a variety of locations where people really um, begin to try to listen to each other. Yeah, and listening is definitely uh, a lost skill. People just are talking past each other nowadays. Well, Steve, you know what's happened is people have such intense feelings that they can't even they can't get beyond the feelings when they hear some some words coming out of someone else's mouth instead of really listening to those words they're already formulating their response before they've really listened to it so you have this dialogue between Don and Bob you said yeah Don and Bob okay so go to YouTube and look for Don and Bob uh, how do right. you expand on that I know we had Joan Blades from Living Room Conversations on our show I think you guys right. are working with them a little bit too no We've, we've worked with them. There's a number of uh, a number of groups that are out right now responding to, uh, as you've described it, this uh, crisis of uh, incivil discourse. Uh, the Jefferson Dinners, uh, Better Angels, uh, Village Square. There are a number of them that are all encouraged at the same kind of thing, getting people together. Uh, Better Angels started uh, their project here um, in Ohio. I'm in Columbus. Here in Ohio... Um, Earlier this year, they had 15 Trump supporters, 15 Clinton supporters get together for two and a half days, really work at trying to understand each other. And that was going to be, you know, the, the point of the effort. But they all, when they got together, they agreed that there was too much in common that they needed to work on uh, to, to stop. So they decided to get together once a month after that to really work at getting to know each other better. And, and I'm glad to hear that. And I'm familiar with Better Angels. I want to get them on my show as well. Um, the Great. fact that you not only get the people in the room, but you have to sustain it, right? You said exactly. Bob exactly. is now say, Bob is now saying to himself, when he does something, how do I put myself in Donna's shoes, so to speak? So exactly, he sustained that. And the Better Angels, through their efforts, as you said, in the Columbus area, that is now turned into monthly meetings. Right. Yeah, because I think starting a conversation is important, but you have to be able to sustain it. So the fact that you've been able to do that is a good thing. Um, I notice on the uh, NICD website, you've got a section now where you're specifically taking on the media. And I, I applaud that effort. I think the media's uh, pushback to me has been a little too strong in terms of how they're reacting to accusations of fake news and characterizations and things like that. I don't think they're able to step back, as you said, and, and see how the world is reading what they're producing. Well, that's a, you know, that's a good point, and, and NICD uh, really has a three-pronged approach. One is elected officials, one's the public, and one is the media, and we've had several uh, meetings, one here in Ohio, one in Idaho, um, where we combine all three groups to talk about uh, their role in this problem. And interestingly enough, in the, uh, an offshoot of what happened in Ohio was the media hearing how much the public and the elected officials 
uh, didn't trust the media. They decided last year to uh, put together a special program during the uh, during the election to try to deal with that. And they had about a dozen, 15 news outlets around the around the state trying to work at really finding out what people wanted to know, letting the politicians know that this is what the public has said they're interested in. And what they found is that, that, that again, it doesn't work if you just try it once. They need to sustain it. So they've re-upped their interest this year. They've got a, a major program. They've doubled the number of outlets that are involved in it. And they're digging down into a couple um, particular interests, uh, issue interests. One is the opi opioid uh, controversy and, and, and difficulties. And uh, they've made a special effort of digging down into uh, the communities to talk about solutions and differences of opinion on, on that issue. So I'm glad you're having these conversations with the media. And I'm, I'm going to date both you and me here a little bit. Because <laughs> when I was growing up, and I suspect when you were growing up, we had maybe four television stations and one news radio station, you know, in the area. And that was it. And, right. you know, maybe most of us just turned on Walter Cronkite and whatever. Walter, Walter Cronkite. Right. Whatever Good evening. This is Walter right. Cronkite. Right. And that, that was the gospel. That was the news. And, right. and, and, and right. he told it like it was. And I, maybe that was his catchphrase. I don't remember. Someone's catchphrase was that. Well, nowadays, not only do we have now 500 television stations and all this media, we have all the way of less newspapers now, we have this proliferation of news that people are getting from the Internet. And I, and I used to like that, but now I think that to a certain extent the media you're dealing with feels that they have to compete with 30 or 40 different outlets every day on the Internet, and that can't, they can't keep up anymore, and they don't know how to market their stories in a way that works. Is, that, is there anything right. you guys talk about? Yeah. How the, how, right, how, right. Yeah, and interestingly enough, one of the things that the, the public found in that the meeting when we had everybody together was they were, they were shocked to learn but probably already sort of believe this, but that many news outlets, print and otherwise, have big screens on their walls tallying a uh, number of, uh, of touches uh, for, for their um, you know, news stories. And so it's all about engagement and tallies and the, the drive to get more people to your site, if you will. And that really, you know, that, that's always been the work of the media, but not so blatantly in terms of, of interactivity. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think, uh, opened the eyes of the, uh, of the public in terms of what's going on. The other thing, obviously, is the role the public now plays in the whole uh, publication and re-publication uh, of news. Something gets put on the news. You 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 know you uh, resend it, you retweet it, um, and if it's if it's true, it's one thing. If it's not, nobody knows because you've retweeted, and on it goes. You know, and there, you're right that retweeting is dangerous. I, I I'm I'm not a big tweeter. I haven't quite figured out tweeting yet. Hmm. But you know, if I see a story, I'm sending it to my group of friends, and I'm passing it along. And I almost got in a trap last year where a story was put out, and I started to. Circular. I said, you know what, I got to do a little more digging on this one. And then right. I did some digging, and turned out it was a fake news story. And I would have right. felt horrible if I had circulated that. So how do you get people to, let's say, take a deep breath even before they push that send button, and say, you know, d and maybe look for one other article even to to support what they're sending out. How do you get? How do you make that stuff happen? Well, that's a good point, and that that is one of the things that we're working on and and providing some tools for people for just that very purpose, to take a breath, to step back, to look for alternative uh, sources, uh, to, to check the sources, to uh, um, really get people a little more involved in the process. Again, take, taking a step back from where your, uh, your anger starts to raise, and that's, that's always the potential uh, problem area. So, in fact, what, I know you've put something together on your site, and it's, it's fascinating to me and, and scary at the same time we even need this. It's called the Citizen Toolkit. So right. you want to walk people through how, the origin of that and, and, and maybe tell my viewers how to find it and what do you expect them to get out of it? 
Um, sure. The the really what we're trying to do is there's a there's a couple things. Um, interestingly enough, we've we've had a program that we created uh, actually for for another area on mental health uh, called Text Talk Act, and it is a way to involve not only uh, young people who are used to texting, but also fo folks who are who are now uh, experienced in texting to get involved. In, uh, and we've, we've got the program called Text Talk Revive Civility. If people would uh, text the word civility to 89800, they are taken uh, to a prompt that gets them engaged in the process that gives them some of these tools. Um, it actually starts out with the video I mentioned, the, the Donna and Bob video. Um, it's a way to engage people in small groups for part of this process as well as an individual to find uh, find their source of information. We also have the same uh, tools and information available on the website, which is uh, nicd.arizona.edu slash revive civility, and people will find the toolkit there as well. All right, so I'm glad you did that. Now let's do both of those again slowly. What's the texting version? What's the website version? The texting is if you would t uh, text the word civility, to 89800 you'll get a series of prompts and then you can engage in the in the process of getting some of these tools as well as actually try to experience some of it and the website you'll find uh, the information at nicd.arizona.edu slash revive civility awesome thanks for that sure so i know i want to get into talking about next generation here briefly but um, what, to me, at the end of the day, all this comes down to is people have to take responsibility for their actions. And Correct. I think our politicians have to take responsibility. As you said, if, if the debate sequence drives some of this lack of civility, they have to step up and take responsibility. If the media, people have to take responsibility. But I, I don't find people in our society nowadays taking responsibility. They want to deflect responsibility. How do, how do we get around that? How do we get people that are going to be brave enough to step, raise their hand and say, you know what, I was wrong and I learned my mistake. Uh, how do you make that happen? It is, uh, it, it is not an easy process. You're talking about cultural change. That's part of the whole process we're using with Next Generation. You've got to create an environment where they feel safe, that they could, number one, admit they might be wrong, uh, be willing to listen to someone else's opinion, and it's a it's a process of building trust, and uh, that's actually what we call our workshops in the Next Generation program: building trust through civil discourse, giving people a comfort level that they can uh, that they can share information. I remember when I was growing up. Again, I'll take us back to a time when you and I were growing up the same period of time, and I'm sure uh, you heard this all the time. The, the you would say, "Well, he started it." <laughs> Right? Right, right. He started it. But that's yeah. all I hear nowadays. Um, right. You know, if, if, there's a vi if there's violence, well, they started it. it. It's not that, hey, wait a minute, I was wrong because I responded to it. They started it. Or, you know, yeah. people like to attack President Trump. He's a, uh, the, the, uh, the favorite fodder for a lot of media outlets. And again, well, he started it. And I, I, that's yeah. maybe a little different slant on taking responsibility, but... How do we get people away from that mindset where their first reaction is, he started it? That, no, I'm off the hook. I didn't start it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's also kind of the same reaction. Uh, you, you, you mentioned this uh, in the beginning here in the introduction, that what, what's happened is that the, the freedom of speech issue, you know, um, we all believe in free speech unless it's something that we, uh, we don't want to care. And then, then maybe some people feel a little differently about free speech. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, a willingness to understand that we're all in this together. And, you know, you, while someone might bring it up first uh, or, or whatever, you know, you just have to stand back and say, okay, I'm a part of this and I want to be a part of the solution. Yeah. And, and lastly, I want to get to the next generation. Ted, what's your organization's theory on, on the, the, the way this becomes so violent? Is there, how, did, how did we go from well, just being uh, uh, incivil to becoming violent? How did that happen? Well, 
you know, part of that is in the use of the language that we've been uh, talking about, that they, the words do matter. And so once you start encouraging uh, people to um, react in an irresponsible way, that raises the level. And once some folks, you know, start doing that, then the other side takes that as a, as a reason to up the ante on uh, hostility. And so the hostility does turn into violence, as you, as you talked about, as we saw what happened uh, in Charlottesville. And I think that that's, um, you know, that's the, a real danger of where we are right now, is that the, um, it, it, it's just a one-upsmanship. And I think that the, the goal is to kind of bring the rhetoric back down and the, hopefully a result the behavior will be brought uh, down as well. Now, to the extent you're working on solving these problems of next generation within the political class, um, right. to the extent the political class will not rise up to do what they have to do, do you see um, others filling that void? On our last show, I know you were in touch with a lot of religious groups that were trying to fill the void, maybe business leaders. Are you seeing that happening, the, the, the lack of uh, discourse on the political side, at least others wanting to step in to solve the problem? Yeah, I think very much what's happening is, uh, and that's the response we've had to the revived civility effort, is that um, a lot of uh, groups that have been involved in this work in the past, but not to the great degree that they're getting involved now, whether it's, like you mentioned, church groups, um, when we've had uh, the faith-based community has really responded and responded in a big way. Um, the uh, uh, I just spoke to Rotary, and Rotary, which isn't has a... If you look at their mission statement, their mission statement is pretty pretty common to what we're talking about right now, and they're looking at ways how can we get involved as well. Uh, the business community, the same thing. Not only is the business community looking at um, you know introducing civility to, to the in the political environment, but their own environment. They they have their own issues within uh, the the business sector. So. I think it's something that everyone is trying to deal with, and it's one of the things that uh, NICD has tried to respond with, tools that can help them do that. So let's flip over to your baby, Next Generation, and yep. talk about some of the stuff specifically you're working on, uh, you know, what, the, what, what Next Generation is and how it's going about solving problems. So, uh, you know, when we first talked, I explained the uh, Next Generation was something that I created and took to... NICD back in 2012 while I was still in the legislature and we put together a half-day program called Building Trust Through Civil Discourse that is a workshop uh, developed by a legislator. I'm a former legislator. Uh, I was a representative here in Ohio for six years and we've, we've trained 40 legislators, Republicans and Democrats. Everything's bipartisan and um, those uh, uh, legislators who are facilitators go into other states at the invitation of the other states to hold these half-day workshops. Since uh, we started in the summer of 2012, we've had 22 workshops in 15 states. Um, we've uh, worked with uh, and had over uh, 500 participants from uh, legislators from uh, over, uh, uh, as I said, 15 states. Um, we've one of the things that's resulted uh, uh, out of this process is a group of legislators, uh, of, of those that have participated, of 100 legislators from 30 states who are um, committed to civil governance and have formed a national network. Um, that national network has uh, been active in sharing ideas that have worked and sharing best practices and coming up with civility resolutions that could be introduced into the legislature and uh, providing some experience for other uh, others to emulate. We've um, we, we focused on, as, as you pointed out, this is not a one-shot deal. We don't want to go in, do this uh, workshop, and then have that be the end of it. We're looking for sustainability. Indeed, we'd like to try to do something to institutionalize it if we can. And in a couple states, they've done that. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting to see another change is we, we worked with initially people who were passionate about this, but not necessarily the leadership. And since that time, we've had a couple leaders, a senator and, uh, or I'm sorry, the speaker and the president of the Senate in Idaho 
invited us in to do the workshop just for their leadership team. So 14 members went through the workshop. They liked it enough. They said, we need to do this for the whole legislature. And over 100, uh, well, actually 104 legislators participated in the workshop. And now uh, both the speaker and the president of the Senate are two of our, our, our biggest advocates. And we've, we've also been invited to uh, do the workshop by the speaker in Arkansas, or the president of the Senate in Oregon. And we've begun to work with a program called the State Legislative Leadership Foundation, which um, together with the National Foundation of Women Legislators, we put together a program where we invited leaders, a Republican and a Democrat leader, and they needed to find the, you know, the, the leader that they could bring to come work with them from 12 different states. So we had 23 legislators uh, participate in a workshop uh, aimed at introducing them to this concept with the goal of having our workshops brought to them. So leadership is key. Next week, uh, Ohio is hosting the speakers conference. Uh, legislative speakers from 30 states will be here in Columbus, and we're going to provide uh, an introduction to the workshop at that session as well. Well, well Ted, you're a great guest, and, and your, your, your work is tremendous. Uh, you're, you're certainly one of the leaders in this area. You know, you, 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 you invented Next Generation, and the uh, Institute is doing great work. So thank you for being a guest, and I hope you put yourself, I hope you put yourself out of business sometime soon. Yeah, well, that's the goal. It, it, it may take a little longer than we'd all hope, but uh, that is the goal. Thank you for having me, Steve. Sure, thank you. So our guest today has been Ted Celeste from the National Institute for Civil Discourse. Uh, he gave you the website, uh, nicd.arizona.edu. Go there. It's, a, unfortunately, a great program to look at, and unfortunately it's a great program because we have big problems. But I want you to take a look at it, and let's get involved here. Uh, let's send that text. Let's watch uh, Donna and Bob. Let's get involved. If we don't stop where we're going, if we don't pare back the violence, if we don't introduce civility into our conversation again, we will never solve a problem. Because if you, it's hard enough to solve problems when you're being civil and you're having that conversation. When you can't even get to the conversation, that's when everything's falling apart. So on our show, we talk about solutions. I think there's some really interesting solutions for you to find today. You can always go to, go to our website at noneoftheabove.us. You can go to the station's website at Grassroots TV. And uh, watch, watch the video. Share it with your friends. That's a good thing to tweet. We're talking about retweeting. Retweet the show. Have them listen to and watch what uh, Ted Celeste had to say. Uh, as we close on every show, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Thank you.